okay, the days where we confront a connection between the, uh, shall we say, the Irish uh, way of doing mechanics, which is uh, Hamilton, and the French approach, which is Lagrange. And the idea is to understand basic calculus, basic uh, principles such as the uh, commutivity of partial derivatives and the chain rules that are used to calculate uh, uh, total derivatives as linear combinations of partial derivatives. So this is a quick review that we're going to do just of the uh, basic idea of elementary calculus. But the um, consequences of that uh, will be seen a little bit today as we uh, look at the actual differential equations that Hamilton and Lagrange uh, give. The thing that you don't see in um, conventional mechanics courses is a mention of the zeroth differential equation. So we're going to bring that up. And I think that just doing that makes it a lot clearer uh, stuff that comes later. So today we also are going to introduce a, a cont what the con a contact transformation means. And um, we're going to be doing it geometrically. We're going to be doing it in a way in which it's very obvious why the word contact is used. But I bet you can uh, find just about 90% of the mechanics books that mention contact transformations but don't make any contact with the word contact. So it always shocked me after I uh, finally realized that there was a way to see through some of this stuff. I will pause briefly to show how this business applies to thermodynamics. People um, don't have to take a thermodynamics course. I think get a place to without it. But it's a... Uh, <laughs> Uh, some people say it's the most difficult subject in uh, physics, uh, just conceptually speaking. And it's because of stuff like that. Now, um, the Legendre transformer is a very special case. And that's one that we want to understand more clearly. Then we're going to go back to sophomore physics, and we're going to use contact transformations to study and explode. Just to, uh, something that blows up uh, in gravity, constant gravity. Okay, so we've got a lot to do, and so I'm going to be rushing through the review of uh, partial differential equations here, which um, is uh, predicated on, I used to own one of these things, a boathouse uh, on Beaver Lake. <laughs> They're kind of sometimes very rickety structures, kind of look like that, and the roofs are all sort of wavy-like. And here I'm just trying to represent a function of two variables and then take a derivative of it, first going up this path right here and then doing a completely different calculation it goes up this path and goes to there. And the idea is the bolt house hasn't collapsed but this part of the roof hasn't fallen down the pillar here or this one warped off in some other direction. So that those two directions should give the same answer. That's really the idea of uh, having partial derivatives. And it's derivatives where one variable, one or more of the independent variables, is held constant while you vary a single one, say the x, or the y, the only two variables uh, playing with uh, here. So the first uh, step shown on that uh, slide right, right there uh, <coughs> is going up the uh, grid uh, arrow and then take, turning a left and then the second one is going up with the green arrow and then turning right. So the idea is that you get uh, two sets of um, solutions for the function that uh, we're trying to uh, estimate at this point. And that's the uh, basic idea. And this one here giving it because I did an x, I knew an x slope and this one because I knew a y slope. Well, uh, somehow that ought to uh, come together at the top and give you the same uh, result. So that's basically what's going on here. Uh, we're doing the calculation one way and then another. Um, 
then asking about their connection uh, to each other. Okay. So, um, we're going to make use of all, slide, all the slide projectors that we have lots to show. So, um, we'll be uh, carrying that through. Now, the, the whole idea of this is that when we've uh, done the, this two ways, let's just go ahead and get to that uh, punchline right here, uh, we have the difference uh, between these two ways of calculating uh, f of x1, y1, the peak of the, of the boathouse, uh, from the lower corner, x0 and y0, involves either using this uh, formula here or this one here. And since we claim we should be getting the same result at that uh, peak uh, to uh, uh, first order, and then this is uh, here something involving the uh, a second order in deltas, uh, we would like uh, that to uh, work out. So, in order for that to happen, these two guys right here particularly have to be equal. And that's the main result here, is that when you do a partial derivative with continuous functions, uh, you can go x first and y second, or vice versa. Okay, now uh, let's see, uh, there's something else we're going to use in mechanics a lot, so I might as well talk about it while we're talking about uh, partial derivatives that make total derivatives, that is, chain rules. And uh, these, uh, <coughs> these rules um, apply uh, here uh, in a number of uh, different ways. The uh, <coughs> lower portion here is a real statement of the asymmetry principle of calculus, this kind of calculus for continuous functions. So uh, let's get used to also some shorthand notation. You probably have seen that a partial with respect to y is just written as a single curly d, and then the independent variable that's being moved. And that's a very simple statement there of the symmetry that we're talking about. But also, I want to point out that most of the time we're doing this, and when we do this Lagrange-Hamilton derivations, uh, we'll be interested in a, uh, the total derivative, and the total change with respect to time, but we'll be asking for the components of it. That is, we'll be asking for the dx dt. We'll be asking for the velocity in the x direction, and then the velocity in the y directions. Both of those contributing with coefficients that are the partial. Uh, derivatives. Uh, as I said before in this class, I'm going to indicate total time derivatives with a dot over, uh, the, uh, in this case, independent variable. And then if you really want a shorthand notation, that's the way you save pencil, right? save your wrist, or whatever uh, that you're uh, using to do all of this. Okay, and a couple other th uh, notations that we uh, should probably get used to. and I'm Pretty sure most of you have already uh, seen the uh, triangle del f. That's a vector that consists of one or, or two or more components, independent variable components. In this case, we only have x and y. But uh, this is a dot product. And we talked a little bit about that last time we were getting used to the quadratic form algebra and uh, geometry that uh, we are going to make use of today. And boy, are we going to make use of it. So there's, I think, the end of the uh, review uh, here uh, of the partial derivative stuff. Uh, next uh, here is um, more of mathematical philosophy, but let's do it. We've already talked about these quantities uh, that are being shown here. First of all, uh, thinking of Lagrangian, and the idea that it's an explicit function of velocity. We started out, that was our first energy function we wrote for the super balls. And um, that was all we had, was kinetic uh, part. There were no potentials or anything uh, um, to mess it up. For now, we're going to not deal with the other parts of the Lagrangian. This is the part that makes the big the difference, the kinetic part. So we had. Uh, here, a mass matrix, as you recall, uh, that's uh, made a quadratic form out of the uh, velocities. 
And then uh, we would jump to this uh, situation here, where instead of, uh, of using the um, uh, velocity, we use the momentum. That means we rescale the velocity with, well, this thing squared. This is the uh, thing that gave us a very convenient uh, description where ne neither the elongated ellipse nor the uh, altitude uh, extended ellipse was needed. We could do it with symmetry, and uh, that made a couple of the more complicated collision problems easier. We're just going to deal with this one and this one uh, for, for now. But remember, there was this uh, root matrix, this square root matrix, square roots of masses, which gave a, a symmetry that was somewhere between the, uh, uh, the Lagrangian, the French approach, and the Irish approach, with the Hamilton approach, which we're, uh, we're just going to keep those two. But the thing that I uh, want to emphasize with all of this is the dependence, the explicit dependence of these two functions, or all three for that matter, which we, we really have, uh, in this case, now three independent sets of variables uh, to use. And it's this uh, idea of explicit dependence, I call it loyalty to whatever variables have been assigned uh, to you. And the idea is that the, <clears throat> the Lagrangian and this weird thing that we call the Lagrangian have no explicit dependence on momentum. They only care about their variables. This one cares about uh, the velocity. And then the Hamiltonian has no explicit dependence on, uh, on velocity. This one has no explicit dependence on momentum. French don't like momentum. Irish don't like velocity. Okay, And neither of them like speedinium, which is the crazy uh, capital V that we brought up. It's the square root of the mass matrix times ordinary velocity. Anyway, the way to write that, and this is what I call the zeroth equations of mechanics, that's this and uh, this, well, right there, that one in particular uh, is uh, of, of interest. Um, I'm sorry, this one in particular. We're going to forget about speedinium uh, 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 now. So the basic idea of this uh, is that uh, this loyalty is a very important part of mechanics calculus. So, um, as I say, astronomy is neglected for now. Uh, the dual to the ellipse geometry, all that kind of stuff is cool, but this is what everyone uses, so that's what we'll talk about. Now, um, basic idea here, having a partial derivative with respect to velocity, and, and given, giving this thing, uh, the basic idea is that when you take that partial derivative, that gradient in the velocity space, you get momentum. And then when you do a gradient in the momentum space, you get velocity. So those are the two, uh, shall we call, first equations. These are the zeros. These are the first. And it's important to uh, point, the, point, the, point out these, this, this uh, staging that we're doing here to get uh, the uh, main equations of motion for mechanics going here. Okay, so I'm going to keep, as I say, uh, all three of these going here. Uh, to remind you um, what we came up with in the uh, development of first the uh, Lagrangian function of velocity and then the uh, Hamiltonian function of momentum as sort of separate entities was that they had a connection. And the connection was precisely the first equations of motion for either one of them. And that, that is, uh, um, you know, just really a cool uh, thing that happens there. The first equation of Hamilton is simply the gradient with respect to momentum of the Hamiltonian <coughs> being velocity. And then the, over in the French, quarter, the uh, first equation of Lagrange is the gradient with respect to the velocity of the components, and uh, it's giving us momentum. So the, the, well, the momentum here 
uh, is that the pointing to the Hamiltonian's place and the tangent to that is perpendicular uh, to the velocity that uh, lives on to the other edge that the French, the Grand would use. Okay, so uh, this is something that we've got to uh, take another look at from another view. And uh, that's what's going to uh, be happening here. But let's just go ahead here and uh, take a look at some things. This is where we really introduce the whole idea of a uh, what's called a contact transformation and then explain why it is a contact a transformation. The basic uh, idea is that you're given a matrix relation like uh, <coughs> this equation that gives momentum as an operator on uh, V, or it's inverse, the inverse of that matrix, those are both at work, uh, one's the blue and the other's the orange uh, ellipse, uh, you might be tempted to rewrite it it's in not, so that you just use the simplest uh, Q form, you just want to rewrite this uh, expression for the Lagrangian or the Hamiltonian, okay, as, as simply um, I just replace uh, <clears throat> this uh, th this Hamiltonian here. I, I know that this is the so I would just get p dot v. The Hamiltonian could you would say just be written one half p dot v, or equivalently Lagrangian could be written one half dot well p dot v or v dot p. And of course, uh, do not forget we're still doing classical physics here, so we don't have to worry about commutation of these as operators, that's quantum mechanics here in classical physics. They are identical. But the thing is, this is only numerically correct to write these. It's the differential properties of it, that is the equations of motion, uh, that's wrong. This is not working. We've got to do something else. Okay, and that's the, that's the, this is the hard part of this lecture right here is to fix this. We've got to fix this thing. We've got to write a relation. Either this or this. You can either write H as P dot V or V dot P minus L. You can write L as P dot V minus H. Does that work? Okay, does that give us the first equations? And the idea is this, this is after Legendre, that's a French, another French uh, mathematician physicist. Uh, uh, coming along and saying, hey, we've got a relationship between the Irish and the French. Here it is. And the idea is that the explicit dependency, that is the non-relations, give the right derivatives. Okay? The partial derivative of the Lagrangian that's being spoken about here with respect to momentum is identically zero, as is the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to velocity identically zero. But then you go in and use the uh, expression here, partial derivative with respect to P of P is just plain V, and then here is the partial derivative of P of H, which does exist, and you get that V is equal to partial H with respect to P. That's the first equation of Hamilton. And then you get the first equation of Lagrange uh, right here. So this little ruse here of fixing this differentially wrong expression uh, gives us the two first equations that are so important uh, for everything in uh, this particular class. Um, there they are. Okay, so uh, now we've got to understand this thing as well as those things. We've got a pretty good feeling for this being the V gradient and for this one being the P gradient over in the uh, Irish Hamilton space. But um, the connection of them is really key. Now, what's really amazing about all of this is this weird stuff that we're doing here with the calculus and the classical mechanics is somewhat iffy, somewhat sketchy. What's behind it? And that's what we're trying to get, uh, I think, uh, in this class above all is all of this stuff, this we call classical mechanics, is based on something inside of the of mechanics that's called quantum mechanics. That's what you're seeing here. That's what's going on here. 
So that's what I want to try to show today as best I can uh, using just classical arguments. All right, let's see if there's anything more that I can do here. Uh, I can leave that one up, I suppose. And I think I will do that. I'll leave that one up. That's showing the relationships uh, that this really is expressing here. And uh, we'll go forward. There's a, the thing that I want to do. Now be aware that the scaling for this is different from the scaling for that. If you have, if you're dealing with a, 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 a very light mass, you might have a very big ellipse uh, for the Lagrangian, and, uh, and then you have a smaller one. But still, this geometry will hold regardless of whether they're big or small. So that's a point I want to make uh, right away. Okay. Now it's the geometry of a Legendre contact transformation. This is this is putting it on the screen, so to speak. How do we uh, visualize uh, this this situation? And uh, while we're at it, I think I'm going to take that one and put this graph up there so we can point at it uh, independently <coughs> later on. Look at what it's saying, and now. Instead of looking down the axis here at an elliptical shape uh, 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 plotted against the velocity vector with our Super Bowl, we only had V1 and then maybe V2 coming out of here. I'm looking down now in the graph over in the extreme right there. I'm looking down at the ellipse, but now I'm studying how the slopes of this particular function, L of V, are related uh, to uh, the quantities over here, the slope and the uh, value of momentum. And th th this is just pointing it out. This is just pointing out what is, is true about this, this relation and the stuff that we use uh, to get classical mechanics going at an advanced level. So basically the idea is that the velocity is the P slope. Okay, that's the first equation. Of, of Hamilton, okay? So this velocity of 1.0 is exactly the slope over here. We're interested in the slope and the intercept. The intercept, the, uh, uh, in this case right here, is down here, and this, the intercept, this particular value here, the p-slope intercept, is equal to the Lagrangian. This is the you know really crazy geometry that's behind uh, this or this relation, okay. and the, uh, 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 the, the by, by by contrast the Hamiltonian here is minus v slope intercept which is over here. Okay, so there's your minus the Hamiltonian just right there. That distance right there is is giving that. All right. All right, <laughs> this is this is pretty weird. Okay, the, the uh, number of things are pretty weird here. So that's weird. I mean, you're used to the, uh, uh, when you change momentum, usually you're changing velocity. So how can this be zero? Same thing with this thing. When you're changing velocity, uh, uh, this thing's supposed to be a function of momentum. Uh, in a normal mechanical motion, certainly they both would be changing, but still, this is zero. Zero. Okay? You got lots of paradoxes sort of going here. Irish French paradoxes. Okay? Right? This is just showing you what it, 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 it will give us um, if we just plot one of these things out. There's a sort of fat ellipse is flying on its side of that diagram down there. This is a skinny one. If you look down on it, it's the one that's going up in the blue a plot on the left on that far diagram. Okay, so we got all these connections between derivatives, slopes, and intercepts that uh, make mechanics. This is, this is exposing the thing uh, geometrically, which uh, uh, I claim. Now, uh, <clears throat> given, given that, Given that, I'm going to jump ahead here a little bit. This is something we'll be doing later. But anytime you want to, you can go to Unit 8 and start looking at this. 
But this is the way it works with relativistic quantum theory going and its geometry. It's the same idea, except now you see the momentum here being traced out on a hyperbola. That's called the quantum mass shell. And this is mc squared right here. And then this is the group velocity. That's the actual classical velocity. So there uh, is the Lagrangian. Okay, right there. It's just a circle upside down, but remember it had a minus sign on it. It's actually down here that it gets to uh, uh, operate in normal ways. And it's congruent to this one right here. And when you're just dealing with tiny velocities, and that's all we do in this building, we, we don't have uh, tera electron volts anywhere in this building uh, yet. Uh, we talk a half an electron volt here and there in, in uh, most of the work we do here. So we would be confined on this diagram to less than a pixel in all of the work that we do. But the thing is, the geometry of this thing is so beautiful, I just have to show it to you. And I will just go ahead here and I hope it will come up. Yes, this is up, something you can click and you can uh, increase the size of it so you can see it. And then you can see how quantum relativistic mechanics really works. Now, when you get down in here where we work, it's all squished together and you don't get to see this beautiful connection between the slopes, in this case, the slope on the momentum curve has an intercept right here that is at the minus the Lagrangian, and then the slope of that one comes back and hits here right at the Hamiltonian and Hamiltonian's function momentum. Momentum goes forever, so does the Hamiltonian. Lagrangian is cut off by the speed of light. I can't go any further than that. So here in one diagram is um, a, a sort of a, a really simple proof of this crazy stuff that we have to deal with when we just do classical mechanics by itself. All right? <laughs> This is a lot to take, I, I agree, but these are all things that you can play with if you want to get a little ahead uh, in this course and have some fun with that. Okay, so that little diagram, and it's sort of sketched over in the corner there, uh, but um, not, uh, it's not very easy. But you've got to realize that um, Galileo has to take a walk. The light cone is something that has a finite speed that is seen the same by everybody, no matter how, what they speed, their speed is. That's weird. But when you start to look at geometry of this, that becomes sensible. Take my word for that one. Okay, that will come later. Okay, now, let's go back to the calculus of this and see if we can explain it that way. This is appealing to something that's, if you don't if you wait through for the normal progress progress of this course, we won't be getting until the last couple of days of the course. But um, you're welcome to look at it ahead of time. All right. Uh, one of the things I have to do is escape here, get this thing going again. You see, see the link? Doesn't work. You see the link at the bottom where it says relativity? Uh, if you see that throughout the literature, that's this yes. approach. Our, that our cute about. name for the relativity of waves, light waves in particular. We seem to be the first to really take a close look at that. And every time we get a visitor, I bring him, I show him, and I think, God, that's the way I should have done it. So this, this is new. And it remains new for quite a long time. Okay, this is too, but it, it it really isn't. This is something, I thought that I had figured this out myself. Turns out Arnaud, the great Russian mechanic, has something like this in the uh, of, um, book of um, mechanics. It's published by Springer and it's a mathematical book. It's, it, it's called The Yellow Perils. The Springer mathematics texts are yellow and, <laughs> and formidable. Okay. The idea is to make this not formidable. Uh, that's my goal uh, for physicists. Us. Okay. Now, um, let's take a look here what it is that's going on. What I'm trying to do is explain how the kind of transformation can work. How do you make 
This partial derivative of the Hamiltonian respect to velocity identically zero. How do you make this Lagrangian partial derivative with respect to momentum identically zero? What's going on here? So let's look at Lagrangian first. Lagrangian is indeed p dot v minus h. So uh, normally what we would be doing is plotting p dot v as a function of v here minus some constant h, which is the intercept. Okay, And we're examining this. We're examining this um, intercept, this decreasing intercept as we come up to uh, a point that we're interested in called the contact point. It's where contact comes in, leads to a unique tangent to the LV curve at the tangent contact point P equal this. So as you're, you're, you're testing all these different lines that this equation gives you with different intercepts and you're trying to find the value of the Hamiltonian that will put you for this particular velocity right on it. Okay, so the tangent line points the extreme value of the Hamiltonian as a function of these pseudo-Hamiltonians as a function of velocity. And the idea is that we're only interested in one value of that, the very best, the optimum value of, of this. The, the, this is where the intercept here is the actual Hamiltonian we're going to deal with. And at that point, that extreme value has no derivative with respect to velocity. That's how you get zero here. End of story for the Hamiltonian. Okay, this is a little squirrely, but it's, this is the calculus of contacts, of contact transformations, which we're going to be playing with uh, in a more uh, lucid manner in just a little bit here. But we really have this connection right here. Tangent line points, extreme value, whatever it is for that particular slope. If the slope goes down, then you'd be down here someplace with the contact, all right? And it works for the Hamiltonian too, similarly, as I say right here, okay? Talking about on the Hamiltonian, if a certain momentum has no derivative of the Lagrangian. It's the extreme value of the Lagrangian intercept is where it touches, contacts, just like this one, only it's dealing with uh, a uh, function of momentum over here, this is the function of velocity over here. Right? Okay, well this is what we're dealing This is what uh, makes this stuff work. All right? Now, the question is, of course, and this will come up in just a minute here, uh, what really does that strange relationship between the two that is trying to tell us? What is it that it, it is uh, what wisdom is it imparting? Now before we go on though, I want to make sure that you see that this stuff is talked about all the time in the subject called thermodynamics. Internal energy, usually a function of entropy S and volume V. Okay, that's it's assigned variables of internal energy. But chemists very often would like to work with enthalpy, for example. It uses the letter H, and it's a function of entropy, but all now pressure, okay? And the Legendre transformation of this to the internal energy involves a product, pressure and volume. Very similar to what we have over here, except there's a no minus sign on this one. But that's okay, because they take the derivative uh, minus the derivative to define the pressure uh, in terms of a derivative with respect to that. So, uh, we make the connection here. Well, Lagrangian, a function of velocity and position, we're talking velocity is the kinetic quantity, is defined as a function of position, velocity, okay? A new function, Hamiltonian, is a, by its, on the right-hand side uh, here, uh, depends on well, not entropy, it depends on position. Okay, well, that's the same for both of them. But the, also, momentum P, coincidentally, uh, analogous to pressure uh, in this particular thermodynamic analogy here. So this Legendre, 
the Legendre transformation right here is the same as what we have except for a minus on the Lagrangian. Okay? And these are the new variables written the way they were written in thermodynamics books. They put the thing as constant as a, a subscript and they actually put numbers in it when they're doing engineering with these uh, functions. Okay? So, our Hamiltonian going from Lagrangian to variable momentum is quite analogous uh, to this uh, stuff. Okay? So I just wanted to point that out. Now let's get down to work here and see what the general contact transformation looks like. This is a mathematical uh, thing that just isn't talked about enough. It is so important to just about everything we do. See if there's anything here. I know I was careful to put a kind of a, a thing where you can just click on that to go back to the zeroth equations and then you can click up there and come back here. So it's quick reading. Uh, of when you guys go, and you really should uh, review this stuff carefully. You see, as I say, extremely important. And all so is this. Okay. Now this is a case where I am going to. This is called an active contact transformation generator, or and the name is action function. So this S here is an actual letter that's used as we begin to make the journey out of classical mechanics into quantum. The action is phase, quantum phase, roughly speaking. Okay? But this action function does a mapping between sets of variables that are, you, are, are having a capital, a, a uppercase, and then some other sets of variables, little x and little y. So it involves a transformation from big x, big y space to little x, little y space done by setting this thing to a constant. So I pick a particular x0 and I go up and I see where I run into uh, the result of solving this equation, s equal 10. And I do it again and again as I try different values of independent variables. So this particular function, s equal 10, makes a curve like that. This particular one right here makes a curve like the next one right here. And then this one makes a curve like that. Just, just, just imagine an ideal situation, okay? Typical situation, not really ideal. So the idea is that after you're done, you've got a bunch of these curves over here, and there's this caustic, that's the name that's given in optics when light uh, makes a, a sharp de demarcation between bright and dark. Anyway, the contacts, the contact, the contact points, it's just a bunch of contact points. That's what is a contact transformation, you see. The idea being that as I vary these quantities over here, I explore this contact domain. As I do the reverse, if I do the reverse, We'll, we'll see that in a minute. The Legendre transformation is a, a, a contact transformation, but it's always using straight lines, intercept and slope. It's more complicated in general. That's what the uh, thing up above is. And uh, it, it goes forwards and backwards. So let's get all of this stuff uh, up on uh, two screens here. Okay. So this works vice versa as well as this is the vice versa. That's the original. All right, so this is what we've been talking about for Legendre, and Hamil Legendre a function and Hamiltonian functions. Uh, the Hamiltonian space is here, the Legendre space uh, involving velocity is over here. Here I'm using Q, we're going to be using Qs for a coordinates. Uh, soon enough, next lecture, uh, that um, just means queer coordinate, I think. Uh, it's, everybody uses Q. Uh, in general relativity and special relativity for um, the uh, coordinate, co coordinations of mechanical objects or quantum objects. Okay, let's see if there's anything else I need to say here. Um, yes. Poincaré's differential action, that's L d t, multiply L that's p dot velocity minus h by dt. You get that. 
P dQ minus H dT. That's really a big clue right there what we're dealing with. This is what it really boils down to as we talk about classical versus quantum. This is the quantum phase. That happens to be the Lagrangian dt. That's a differential of action. And that is momentum, the Broglie rule, h bar k. This is dr, q is called r before we get into the deep stuff that's on the wall over there. And then this h here, that's Planck's relationship of the Hamiltonian to frequency. What frequency? We've got to decide that uh, later on. But if we just talk about light, this is uh, up to quantum mechanics of light. So we're right there. Okay? So that is a, a quantum phase differential. And as I say, this extraordinary claim needs extraordinary proof. You saw the diagram that leads to that uh, be, uh, in our little picture uh, that uh, showed uh, Lagrange Hamiltonian relativistic quantum mechanical variety. So this is stuff that we're going to talk about a little bit in chapter 12 of this unit. But then we'll be doing all classical stuff until we get to the very end of this course where you get to see in unit 8 uh, how, how this works. Okay, so um, this is a lot of stuff. I, I want to uh, now go ahead just a bit here to sophomore physics. Okay, so we're going to stop doing this advanced stuff for a minute here, and we're going to go back to sophomore physics. Okay? Relief. <laughs> okay? Now it's easy stuff. Uh, not so easy to what we're going to do. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about two systems. One really very quantum mechanical one at the uh, NIS Boulder Labs in which uh, a, a bunch of um, atoms are allowed to expand, a little poof, and they explode as they rise in a chamber here and then fall. Or, and this is a violent activity going on, on uh, one of Jupiter's moons, Eel. The moon of Eel. Volcanoes. Volcanoes on Eel. And this is what they look like uh, if you try to plot them out in the ideal of uh, the ideal volcano. I'm going to try to show uh, that, and then we're going to work it out. So this is just sophomore physics of trajectories, but a whole bunch of them, a family of trajectories, and those family of trajectories have contact lines. Okay, so this is where we're going to study contact transformations in geometry of them. And the idea, of course, is that if you have a computer to do this, you literally can produce the quantum wave function associated with this experiment right here. So, let's just do the classical stuff. Uh, you all know that if you shoot a gun at 45 degrees, you get a kind of a maximum range. So there's an example of a contact point that's maximizing a particular trajectory by reaching the envelope, contacting the envelope. Okay. So with all the terminology of contact becomes a little clearer. We have an example like this. Okay. All right. Let's see if we can get ahead on this one, maybe a little closer. I want to actually show you this thing in action. Literally in action. Okay, that's, uh, you can see the circle there that it forms. But let's just see if I can get this to work uh, slowly. A little faster than I expect because these computers are fast. But that, that is what we're looking at. And I can you know, stop this at any time. Or I can just start over. Re I can just uh, reset t equals zero and do it again. This time you just see a circle coming out and then slithering down the envelope. Okay. Let's erase the paths. Reset t equals zero. 
and pause. Okay, so at first, it's just a bunch of particles all coming out with the same velocity. That's the idealization. Here it's, they're really careful about it. The idea of this, this device right here is to have uh, the atoms at the very top of this thing come, and right there, they read the spectra, the spectral vibrations of this. This is the thing that sets our time. For a long time, we've used this. This is what's giving you uh, a 12-figure accuracy on uh, a clocks. And it's been improved to the point where it's 13, 14. Now they're working on stuff that gives 18s. Ridiculous. I mean, if clocks now that would, would lose a sixth of a second in the age of the fucking universe. Sixth of a second. <laughs> that's what we have now. This was amazing already. Okay. But that's, that's what we're dealing with here. Now, this um, particular thing, this watch just says, you have fallen down. That's because I'm like that. <laughs> So yeah, it's going to call the ambulance. <laughs> All right. Uh, so here is the, the certain now. If you were to um, be in the inertial frame studying this, that is, suppose you, you got thrown up so that you were always at the center of this uh, circle that's going out, you would just see a circle expanding forever in your frame. I mean, that's, that's a trick you can always do when you want to explain complicated things in the gravity field, is just get yourself in the inertial frame. That means you fall, or you leap up and fall. In this case, you leap up and then fall with a circle. So you fall with the center of the circle, and all you'll see is these balls going out, expanding around you at a constant rate, okay? until you hit something on the way down, right? So that's the trick here. You see, but to so, so sit here in the lab frame and let this uh, resume, okay, you see that right about there, this particular ball reached the top, stood there for a while, in, 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 a tiny instant, right, and then begins falling. So here's the ball, still spherical, okay, but now it's got a contact point to an envelope that is itself a parabola. That's what we're dealing with. And this is what the homework problem on Wednesday will be uh, dealing with. This is, you'll just be mostly working with this uh, particular example of a family of trajectories. Uh, something that uh, I think is really important. Let's just go a little further now. The contact point now pretty close to around in here. It's hard to tell, you see, that's the thing about contact points, is that they, um, once you, you are one of them, as long as you stay on that contact curve, you don't, have to, you don't have much change of any of the variables associated with you. And so finally it just falls all the way, and we just stop right here, where the contact point is now way down here on the extent of this parabola. Uh, here. That is the parabola that all of these trajectories together make. They make a perfect uh, parabola. Okay? And that's kind of what you're seeing right here. You see the ends of a... Well, it's not quite a parabola here because we're talking about a non-uniform gravitational field, that is a Coulomb field, spherical, this turns out to be an ellipsoid, but it's so close to a paraboloid that good enough for folk music for a few. We'll come later, we'll solve that too. But this is the one I want you to look at first. Uniform gravity, something blowing up with constant velocities in uniform gravity. Okay? So, this is just a big picture of that same thing, obviously. Uh, and you can click on this to play with it, and you can change variables like that. They're all right up front in this particular uh, application. You have to go to the control panel uh, to get most of the, the things here. Okay, so uh, uh, let's do the physics of this. That is, let's remember 
the formulas uh, for parabolas of trajectories. Okay, basic idea of the of the um, x coordinate. That's really simple. There's no gravity in x, so whatever velocity I give this thing, and it will be determined by the angle that I shoot it at, alpha. Okay, say 45 degrees, but 90, zero, minus angles. Okay, you shoot in all directions equally on uh, velocity. All right. And of course, uh, that means that the uh, x derivative, the velocity derivative, is a constant depending on uh, the value of your elevation of the, of the uh, initial, traje initial trajectory. And then y, well, y's got a minus 1 half gt squared, this is constant gravity. Okay? And <clears throat> there is also uh, something associated with the, um, the, the sine alpha, that is, if you uh, should give this a certain velocity and there wasn't any gravity, then this would just be equivalent to this, but with a sine instead of a cosine. So, you all remember this. I don't have to lecture too long on sophomore physics, do I? Okay, you got, you got this, right? And then the derivative of this and uh, things like that. Okay? So, uh, what we do is get rid of time. We just put these two guys together so we get y as a function of x. So we get y equals some constant, in this case the tangent uh, as of the angle alpha, uh, and then a, a constant here, the complicated looking thing involves uh, the um, <coughs> x squared uh, that uh, uh, this uh, uh, would uh, give you. And so we end up here with a tangent alpha expression and then an inverse cosine squared expression having uh, x squared. That is supposedly the equation of one of these blue curves. But you name the alpha and it's a different curve. Okay, looking at alpha differently, it's all of these curves right here are all summed up by this. So the question is, how do you take that thing, and I escape over here to get to that point, how do you take that thing um, and, uh, let's see if I can escape. Uh, here, I should have gotten that thing. I think maybe that is it right there. Yes. Uh, how do you take that and analyze it? Okay. So here's a solution. This is one way to do it. Um, I produce an active contact transformation generator. Right. I just turn this equation around. Let's bring the y over to that side. And just write this thing and set it equal to a constant. Let's we'll start with zero because that, that pretty much uh, gives us the easiest algebra at this point. So what we're going to do is we're going to imagine there's a contact space described by the initial velocity and we're going to just take points on a horizontal line and keep that constant and then we'll try different alphas. For example, Alpha equal 45 will be maximum range uh, if the trajectory uh, will have to stop at the, at the plane, the x line there. And then, as I vary that angle to higher angles, I will get another trajectory, and then another, and then finally one that just goes up and falls back down. So the idea is to find out what is the curve that those all three and everyone in between shares all the contact points. We're just looking for contact points now. Okay? Simple enough. All right. Well, let's go for it. This is the tricky part of this. The thing about a contact point is that is the place where the derivative of this thing with respect to the parameter in question, that's the parameter in question right there, is nothing. It doesn't change. It's a first order. Okay? So if I change the alpha just a little bit, all this thing's going to do is just move over a pixel for another new contact point that's nearby. 
But since you're on a tangent already, it's no change. No change in S. No change in action. Now, did I mention already that the most famous of all contact transformations is Huygens' transformation? Light wave goes out, puts out lots of other light waves, who each form a new contact curve, which is the new wavefront. That's the way all waves propagate. Light waves, quantum matter waves, you name it. That's the key, right there. The contact business is going on in wave mechanics. Always. That's the, that's the real grabber right there. Okay. But this is really important just to solve this problem. Okay. Now what you're going to find as we play with these problems is that the geometry almost always wins in terms of the ease with which it derives the results. This is a case of geometry winning. I've shown you a couple of cases where you know, it just stinks. The algebra is really fast and quick. Here the algebra, even for this thing, the sophomore problem, it should be a sophomore problem, it isn't, but it should be. I mean, they've all had partial differential equations by that time. Uh, so I, I have to take a partial with respect to alpha of this mess and set that equal to zero. Okay? So here's a sophomore problem. It is not trivial at all in the algebra. But the geometry, if you get used to it, is quite simple. Okay, so what I do when I have uh, the, when I write this thing out uh, in its sort of this gory detail, I have zero, I can write it this way, and I can write the tangent alpha uh, aside, and I have the x be the inverse of that. So I make use of both of those in writing the equation, rewriting the equation uh, that I'm uh, trying to derive. And this is the uh, tangent alpha minus blah, blah, blah. And that leads this equation right here. And uh, that better come out to be a parabola. It does. There is the envelope equation right there. That's the envelope function. Okay, so this is rather humbling. Anytime you try to do algebraic solutions to contact problems, you're looking probably at a, a fairly complicated transcendental equation. This one is algebraic, but uh, most of the others are transcendental equations. So uh, algebra is sometimes pretty hard uh, to get. Uh, optimization. This is an optimization in the sense of finding out where are the extreme contact points for each trajectory. How far does it get? What's the boundary that it makes? Now what we'll be doing in um, uh, chapter 12 is making more use of this, but in this case, we're going to plot the action on every one of these curves. And when you do that, you produce an outline of the actual quantum wave function. So well, that's something to look forward to, isn't it? <laughs> Being able to um, generate by geometrical pictures. This is a computer doing all the work, basically, but you've got to program it in order to, get it to do that. Of, of the uh, actual wave functions that we you mentioned, have. you mentioned Eric Heller's book at the beginning of this class. Right, and Eric Heller and uh, his student, uh, Michael, uh, were the, really the first to realize that a lot of problems in atomic physics, but chemistry, chemistry has lots of things where they have study the wave mechanics of particles doing various things with light, usually, uh, was able to turn horrible uh, problems, very simple ones, by making use of action. Now this is um, Prometheus, another moon that just isn't happy with itself at all and is always belching and farting and making things like that. Okay, uh, and now of course the velocity isn't exactly constant for all the things coming out of that, neither are they necessarily going in a random 
that is spherical distributions, but still almost every one of the volcanoes that have been photographed have the you know, almost parabolic uh, shape. Uh, as I say, um, the elliptical uh, envelopes are li it's still harder to, to calculate. Uh, much This is trivial compared to that. So anyway, there they are. Uh, this is um, just to give you a, a couple of links uh, to the Galileo and um, other uh, explorations that occurred uh, to see this. And then also, when NASA draws pictures, sometimes they don't draw them very well. I say this is a pretty bad sketch of the plumes. I call it the Las Vegas model planetary ejecta. Uh, it's got a flat top on it. And it looks like a, a one of those fountains in Las Vegas. So uh, that's definitely not, but that's just a sketch. That's crap. Uh, as you can see in all of their photographs, there's a, a, a nice round shape of the, of the plumes. Okay, so that I want you to uh, be aware of. Now, how are we going to do this, um, the geometry? And that is um, just in the last uh, 10 or so minutes here, I'd like to. Um, uh, show you uh, just a couple of things that uh, help you uh, understand uh, the geometry of just this uh, problem right there. And um, I remember I told you that uh, you could um, <clears throat> associate every point uh, on the uh, parabola, uh, particularly the points that are above the focal plane, like this one, and this one's even higher, with an American kite, the, the standard, uh, not the Chinese kite. Chinese kites are all kinds of wonderful shapes, and some of them look a lot like that, and, and there are box kites. This is a very special kite right here. It's simply a square, and the uh, geometry of the, of the parabola uh, has you have a slope of one opposite the focus. It doesn't matter what the parameters are for that parabola. If it's a parabola opposite the slope, you have either plus or minus one as your slope, and that means you'll make a square kite, which will be pointing directly at one of the um, p factors, a p factor that goes in this equation right here. That is uh, the lattice radius times 2 or 4 times p factor there, there so lattice radius is 2 times the p factor of the parabola All right. so uh, there's a tangent pointing out that one as I uh, go higher as I go higher and higher then uh, I, I come away from 1 so here's minus 1 over on this side this is a negative slope okay and um, I come here with a slope of minus 2 at this particular juncture, okay, which happens to be uh, right at the circle of curvature uh, for the parabola. Now, we're not worried so much about that circle of curvature, but are you aware that there is a circle expanding from the explosion? And you have to ask yourself, uh, does this circle play a role in this uh, scenario and turn it over and make it into a, uh, 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 a volcano on Io or Prometheus. So, uh, idea being then that you're pointing out the slope in units of P of the tangent at this point, or this one right here uh, at two and a half. Okay, it's the other thing going up pretty fast as you um, change there. But inside, inside, uh, as you're below the focal plane, then after you, you have made your square, then your square just sort of contracts into a diamond rhombohedron, rhombus uh, shape, okay, with its little tangent uh, right there, uh, pointing, pointing at a particular value of uh, about a half. I think I'm exactly a slope of half right there. Okay? So, be aware, this is the key. This kite construction is the key uh, to solving the geometry. I'm going to be asking you to uh, 
construct and plot a trajectory on a piece of graph paper like this, um, assuming uh, that you have enough speed to get to that point and no more. So that's as high as you're allowed to go on this um, homework problem. And then you're going to be filling up this whole area here with a couple of things. The main thing uh, that you see right away is a circle of expansion. But then there's also all the parabolas that each of these make. And what's the envelope that goes with that? So you can um, <clears throat> answer questions like this, where is the focus uh, of a, a particular trajectory like this one. Okay. So we say alpha equal 90 degrees, that's an easy one, rises to uh, what we're going to call 1.0 and drops. So if that was all there was, was done up and down, we wouldn't have much of a problem. It's all the others that we want to find out. But anyway, where's the focus for that one? You see, and the answer pretty much is uh, right there. Right, that's a degenerate parabola. Right? So the focus is right at the tip. Tippy tip. Okay. Now, where is the blast wave at this particular uh, a moment when it reaches that high? Okay. Well, that's uh, fairly obvious. The blast wave has to be containing that point, and it has to be centered here. So, there's a circle that gets you started on that part of the thing. Okay. And then, where on the x-axis does the 45-degree path hit? Okay, we're talking about uh, x-axis and 45, okay, well, uh, you know that's a maximum range. The maximum range has to be right there. So that's one that you can psych out pretty easily and um, so forth. So these are all um, things that set uh, the basically the, the uh, parabolic kite, there is the parabolic kite right there pointing to it. Uh, and the uh, thing that you can prove fairly easily is the directrix for the trajectory is here. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but you need the directrix for the envelope. It's going to be somewhere else. And that's not part, part, part of the uh, problem. So these are all questions that you ask to answer uh, to finally create a uh, diagram of this. So I'm going to be asking you to get the uh, blast curve. This is the blast wave that uh, uh, was existent when that point was reached. Then that blast curve slides down the envelope that this, this thing makes. That uh, the, the envelope that we saw. So the alpha equal 45 on by con uh, contact point, maximum horizontal range. So it must be tangent to this blast circle. That's what we call it, the, uh, the circle. It's as though the thing erupted suddenly and produces. They haven't ever seen that. They've ne never been lucky enough to see a volcano starting up. They're usually running uh, for hours. Uh, and then they sort of peter out and then come back on the thing sometime later. Okay, so all of this, these are things, and then the question is, where's the focus, where's the directrix for the external envelope, as well as each trajectory? Where is the locus of the focus? Okay. This is just going a little bit further with the uh, analysis. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this uh, is that when you do get, um, <coughs> this is a, a circle right here, but then there's a parabola that's just contacting that, and then there is parabolic en envelope, and at this point you can sort of fare that out, figure out where that is. And this is just with 45 degree, we're only looking at one trajectory here, uh, besides the one that goes straight up and down. A couple more clues uh, here with this. I've let the thing fall 
uh, just a little bit. Let's see, this is, the, this is the blast occurred at this instant down to there, and so forth. This is looking at a 30 degree. Now, the, the thing that is pretty obvious about the construction is that um, at any particular point that's a contact point, and this will mean making a, a lot of, a, a lot of um, use of this later on, but the idea is that the focus uh, for the envelope and the focus for the particular trajectory that contacted right here have to be on a straight line. And not only that, but the kite associated with the trajectory has to be congruent to the kite associated with the envelope at that particular point. Okay, so just to give you a feeling for what we want to get out of the geometry of this. So we're going to be asking you to do alpha equals 30, alpha equal 45 is easy, uh, alpha equals 60. After you've seen both of those, you can, or all three of those, you can see what they all look like. So there's a lot of physics and what, whatever uh, that goes with this, but also the geometry, uh, once you get used to it, is really simple. So are you ready for the problems on Wednesday? That's what it's going to be. Okay, this is a fun problem. Now, neatness counts. <laughs> okay, you'll be great uh, as a professional drawer as well as a physicist and mathematician. Okay, that's fair, right? And that's true for what you're going to publish later on. If you can publish something that really looks cool, it's going to count. People will say, hey, did you see this? And word spreads. Okay. All right, I think I'll uh, just quit. Um, there's some more stuff there. Lecture ends. Now, this is all stuff that hangs on the end of the lecture. And look at your leisure. But um, be prepared for this particular uh, problem. <laughs>